Imagine as you are sitting in your home in Galilee that everyone in the town is distracted by news that's circulating. A man is, is healing people. There was the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda who had, who had been in his infirmity for 38 years. There's the, the one with the withered hand. There was power actually coming out of this man who was healing people. And perhaps maybe you have some illness in your family or you have um, someone that you love and care about who uh, has their own infirmity or sickness or disease or maybe is even terminal. And you are curious, immensely curious about this man. And so you want to find this person who everyone is talking about. Again, you live in an age where there are no newspapers or cell phones or uh, social media. These things are passing by word of mouth from people that you know and you trust and who have seen these things for themselves. So everyone tells you that this person's name is Jesus and that he is in your town at that very moment. So as you look, you see a huge crowd of people walking together. And uh, as you go to the city center, uh, you can tell that the commotion must mean that, that Jesus is around. So you push your way to the front of the crowd, uh, elbow your way to the front to, to look over, to get a peek, to see what everyone else is looking at. And you see it for, your, for yourself. With your very own eyes, you see Jesus heal someone simply by touching them. And as Jesus begins to move to the outskirts of the city and to make his way up on a mountain, uh, you eagerly follow. You try to see what everyone uh, else is following him to or where he's going or what's going to happen next because the excitement is something that you just can't contain. He makes a break from the crowds as much as possible and he goes up a mountain and gets just to the distance of the crowd's ear and takes with him a few of his closest chosen friends. And so you are at a distance, but you see him uh, just out of earshot on the mountain with his disciples. And you see those disciples gather closer to Jesus as he, as he sits and begins to teach from that mountain. And you look nearby and you, you hear the crowd begin to mumble, who are they? And someone says, those are his disciples, those are his followers. And Jesus turns his attention from the crowd to his disciples, those who closely follow him. And he begins to read or recite, actually, what we call now the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And you'll notice here, uh, I have read Matthew's account of the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount uh, that takes place not long following the call of Matthew. Uh, Luke also records for us some of these same sayings in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. No doubt you are familiar and you've heard these Beatitudes many times before. It does not take away from the beauty of them and the uh, amazing, uh, powerful nature that they have. It must have been amazing to be there that day, to just imagine people from every stage of life, all groups of people trying to find something meaningful for their life, but but noticing, uh, again, as I described the scene for you in the opening, that the crowd was not actually the, the group who Jesus directed the Beatitudes to. Jesus does not address the crowd with the Beatitudes. He addresses his disciples. And we sometimes think that Jesus when he taught, was teaching radical uh, ideas. But the, the truth of the matter is that the only reason why these ideas were radical is that they were the actual uh, fullness of what God had intended and taught through the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus, as he speaks to his 12 uh, Jewish followers, is not... Uh, choosing an entirely new set of things to, to discuss with them, to follow and to be the kinds of uh, God followers that they needed to be. Jesus was just emphasizing the actual teaching of the, the old covenant, the old law, which had often been lost in his day and time. And the blessings that God saw uh, that would come through living this kind of life that the Beatitudes describe is consistent throughout history, but it had been lost in the current culture. And God's mind doesn't change on that sort of thing. And Jesus just happened to be the vehicle through which God could share this news of, of what it means to live a blessed life. And he does so through the Beatitudes. So as we are uh, at the outskirts of the crowd, trying to overhear him teach his disciples, we are pushed, uh, maybe we, uh, for this imaginary uh, time Maybe we just imagine ourselves as actually one of the disciples sitting around Jesus. We are immediately focused on then the fact that these are not earthly callings, that the Beatitudes push us, and this is the beauty of the Beatitudes, that they push us beyond a physical, uh, worldly idea of success and happiness and joy and push us into reflecting on what it means to have spiritual success and spiritual happiness and spiritual joy. And the Beatitudes, as I said, they come from scripture. And even though his followers would have been uh, Jewish believers um, from their birth, 
they needed these encouraging words to be reminded of and not just taught for the first time. And the text is very clear uh, that Jesus is directing these words specifically to his disciples. In Matthew 5, 1, uh, he sa it says, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Luke 6, verses 19 and 20, it's even more emphatic. It says in verse 19, all the people, but then in verse 20, he turns his gaze towards his disciples and begins to say, so why do I keep emphasizing this, this fact that he is directing this to his inner circle? I think that if we're going to understand these blessings today, we need to put ourselves in the context of when Jesus first said them. Jesus was encouraging his followers, those who were truly committed to him, those who had accepted him already, and he was pronouncing to them the spiritual blessings that could come, not necessarily in this life, but through this life and in the, the life to come. And that those spiritual blessings come from scripture, which Jesus knew uh, very well, and that he could share with them and quote for them. So what are the blessings that Jesus pronounces to his followers, those that are, we might say, in his inner circle? Well, Matthew 5, 3 is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can find a parallel to this in Psalm 34, verses 15 through 22, and look especially at verse 18. The poor in spirit are people who are emptied, bankrupt of pride, and look to God to meet their needs instead of the world. And Jesus says that they will be blessed. Uh, we often um, struggle with, with emptying ourselves and giving our dependence on God uh, solely. I think for, for many of us in the culture that we live, uh, it's often hard to know what it's like to be empty um, in, in the major ways that we, we speak. When we do feel it, I think it is when we experience great loss or difficulty in our lives. Is when things are going well, is that it's hard to feel this sort of spiritual emptiness that can only be filled by God, would be the way that I would put it. And um, so it's an actual, it's, it's work. It's a little bit of work to when uh, we do not want for anything, and then we do have... Uh, uh, things are going well in our lives. It's, it's hard to keep ourselves dependent on God in the way that we should. But Jesus says that that's where blessing comes. It's when we make ourselves emptied, bankrupt of pride, so that we can depend on God to meet our every need. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who mourn, uh, you might uh, look at in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. People who are heartbroken and look to God for comfort. You'll notice as we go throughout these Beatitudes, the focus, I think, at least in my opinion, that Jesus is trying to get us to, to, to consider is our utter and total dependence on God. We, through mourning, again, this is, is hard to think about, but through mourning and pain, uh, we actually come to know God more for his comfort. And uh, in the moment, uh, in the moment or out of the moment, actually, uh, we do everything we can, many of us, uh, to avoid pain. 
to avoid thinking about the difficult things in our lives and to avoid mourning them, if at all possible. But Jesus says that mourning brings you to God for comfort and that blesses you. And so that is the blessing that can come in Christ. Now you'll notice as just we're just getting started here with the Beatitudes, right off the bat, you'll notice that these do not fit a typical success type model of thinking. Uh, we don't typically think of being poor uh, in spirit or being one who mourns as a list of success. And this is what was so revolutionary about Jesus's explanation of the Old Testament scriptures and his leadership as our Christ and our Savior is that Jesus doesn't see success. God doesn't see success in the same way that the world sees success. And so all those people standing on the outskirts of the crowd, hungering and thirsting for what Jesus has to offer, are itching and yearning in a society and in a culture that where it was brutal, to be honest with you, where violence and brutality and money uh, all ruled the day and nobility ruled the day. And Jesus makes the kingdom available and pro provides blessing upon those who uh, would have otherwise not seen a path to success in their lives. And maybe this same appeal appeals to you today. It's a little harder probably uh, at times in our culture because we live in uh, more comforted times, but these are the ideas that Jesus is trying to express through the Beatitudes. In verse five, Jesus says, blessed are the gentle. Meek is uh, probably the word that you've heard for this one, for they shall inherit the earth. Psalm 37 and verses 10 and 11 speak to this meekness. Uh, meekness is not weakness, and I know you've heard that before. Meekness is knowing your position in the kingdom and looking to God for strength, finding your strength not in yourself but in God. Again, all of these things pointing to our utter and total dependence on God. Matthew 5 and verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You can find this uh, in the Psalm 107, verses 4 through 9, in this hunger and desire and thirst for righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Jesus will say, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Jesus is to be the object of our desire, our seeking. Righteousness is to be the object of our desire and our seeking. And we will be satisfied if that's the desire of our seeking. Uh, coincidentally, if our seeking is after things other than righteousness, we will most likely not be satisfied. In a worldly view of success, a worldly beatitude might be, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for wealth or power or fame. And those things leave us unsatisfied. But in Jesus's kingdom, we can be satisfied as we seek and hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. For the merciful, you can look at Proverbs 14, 21 or 17, 5. And for verse 8, you could look at Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Again, all teaching that was clear in the Old Testament that Jesus is simply reinforcing uh, in a new age. 
Now, I want you to notice uh, the transition uh, at the very end, verses 9 through 12, uh, uh, as, we, as we finish out our thinking here. Notice that he changes person from blessed are those who to blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. What do you think Jesus is doing here as he describes the blessings that can come from a dependence on God and then directs his thoughts to the disciples to talk to them directly about their personal blessings? I'm curious if he isn't indicating to them that these blessings won't always feel like blessings from time to time. When the dependence on God means that that's no dependence on the world. When the world is insulting and persecuting and rejecting, finding that comfort and that strength and that reliance on God may not, it may not feel like a blessing in the moment but that Jesus needs to remind them to rejoice and be glad because their reward is great because they are then identified with the same people of old, the, the prophets loved and believed in God and they received the same kind of rejection. So, we can, I think, feel these same blessings for us. But we have to be intentional about understanding the world this way. Actually, not even the world, understanding the church and the spiritual blessings this way. Because if we're not careful, we won't think about these as blessings and we'll think more about what the world provides as blessings. And if we get those things mixed up, the world will be good to us. The world might even be great to us, but we will be empty and we will not be dependent on the God that we serve. But Jesus offers a different kind of success model in the Beatitudes that we can search for the right things, that we can pursue good things, and that even though the world may not understand that and the world may reject it, we will be closer to God as a result of it. And our reward, notice that, our reward will be great and will surely be worth it all. May God bless us as we try to change our minds, as we try to fight against the world's teaching and as we try to stand above and beyond it and listen to Jesus instead of the world to guide our actions every single day. My prayer is for blessing for you and your family as you endeavor to see the good in the Beatitudes.